Hello everyone. In this video, we will talk a little about the history of slavery in the United States, the mistreatment of black women by slave owners and famous African-American slave owners. What was the reality of enslaved black women during slavery? The reproductive life cycle of enslaved women consists of rape, pregnancy, giving birth in a camp, and with little or no recovery within six to 12 weeks. One could be pregnant again. Childbirth began at an early age, when the girls were old enough to do fieldwork and give birth. Time and time again, this provides the historical narratives of the sad reality of the reproduction of enslaved women. I constantly remind readers that the accumulation of wealth was always at the core of slavery. By the time a baby was born, a teacher could start accumulating interest on that baby, which had a cash value at birth. Violence, sales, and separation were the harsh reality of enslaved women. Physical punishment was sometimes extremely violent and could result from women's refusal of slaveholders' sexual advances. Black women were essentially legally raped. This is a rape industry. And even the term slavery becoming a euphemism to refer to the reality which we do not discuss. Enslaved women had no right to their bodies, no right to their children, and no right to refused forced breeding. Many women were unable to escape enslavers' sexual assault, particularly without being beaten as a result. Women who labored in plantation homes were at a particular risk of sexual predators because they worked in close proximity to white men. Many masters raped enslaved women and rewarded obedient behavior with favors, while rebellious enslaved people were brutally punished. A strict hierarchy among the enslaved from privileged houseworkers and skilled artisans down to lowly field hands, helped keep them divided and less likely to organize against their masters. Something people need to understand during slavery, rape of an enslaved woman was not a crime under most state laws. In Georgia v. State, the Mississippi Supreme Court ruled in 1859 that an enslaved black man could not be convicted of raping an enslaved woman because it was only a crime to commit rape on a white woman. Marriages between enslaved men and women had no legal basis, but many did marry and raise large families. Most owners of enslaved workers encouraged this practice, but nonetheless did not usually hesitate to divide families by sale or removal. Enslaved women's responses to the sexual advances of white men varied. Some fought back, regardless of the consequences of their actions. Others acquiesced in an attempt at self-preservation. Second is the idea that there is no such thing as a black child. There are no black children, only the smallest, the youngest versions of enslaved bodies. They can be sold, beaten, raped, killed, and discarded. The painful story of rape, auction, and abuse can never be fully told, not even in the 754 pages of the Slave Coast of America, the American Slave Coast. For women unable to escape sexual advances, in violence of white men, the results could be very difficult for mothers and children. When I was a little girl, I went to a colored person's wedding. She was a black like that thing over there, tabletop card. But she was his young master's wife, and he let her marry because he could get her to marry him. Would limit him at any time if he wanted her. White men and women were complicit slaveholders. Even as white women expressed anger towards enslaved women and their children, they served as co-masters by supporting their husbands and gaining economic and social benefits from owning slaves. When white men or women were violent towards enslaved women, they saw it as part of the necessary order of their world, ignoring enslaved women's unwillingness to participate in sexual acts. Sexually exploited women were left assaulted and sometimes pregnant by enslavers or overseers. Their trauma was worsened because they knew that they had little ability to protect themselves from harm in the future. When they did bear enslavers' children, they had an extremely limited ability to keep their child safe or keep them from being sold away. Their exploitation served the egos and whims of the enslavers or overseers who most often treated black women as objects, not humans. The exploitation of their bodies continued with enslavers' demands that they reproduce to ensure a subsequent generation of forced, bonded labor. Was a free black really a slave during slavery? To understand the history of slavery, we have to see it from all angles. Like the whites, I am not talking about the majority. 
because to own a slave or several slaves at your service meant that your standard of living was above others. And we all know that equality in the position and distribution of wealth is not the same for everyone. That also includes a large part of the white population. But we also need to know that just as whites own slaves, we need to know that many free blacks in the southern states also own black slaves. Some African Americans who held slaves in the United States were former slaves who were able to buy their own and their family's freedom, while others were free people of color who inherited or purchased slaves. Just as in modern times, there are people who are complicit in the atrocities against their own people. In the era of slavery, there were also many slave and free blacks who acted against the black slave population, committing the same atrocities in the complicity with slave owners. William Ellison in South Carolina was the largest slave owner in South Carolina, richer than 90% of all white people. Guys have to read the story of him. William Ellison Jr. was named April by his mistress when he was born into slavery around, 1907, around 1790 on a plantation near Winsboro, South Carolina. The name indicates the month in which he was born, which was a common slave naming practice at the time. In 1800 to 1802, the mixed-race boy was documented as the property of William Ellison of Fairfield County, the son of Robert Ellison, a planter. Ellison eventually won his freedom and went on to have a prosperous career as a cotton gin manufacturer and plantation owner. He ran a sizable plantation in South Carolina with the assistance of enslaved people who worked there. He was also involved in politics on the local level and served as a representative for his district in South Carolina's state legislature. Anthony Johnson, 1600 to 1670, was an Angolan who achieved freedom in the Virginia colony in the early 17th century after serving his deed of issue mandate. He became one of the first African slave owners and owners there. Celebrated as a servant in 1621, he obtained his freedom after several years and was granted land by the colony. One of the first African Americans known to have owned slaves in the British colonies in North America. He was one of the first people of his race to do so. He later became a successful tobacco farmer in Maryland. In particular, he is renowned for achieving great wealth after being a servant and has been referred to as the Black Patriarch of the first Black property community in America. John Carruthers Stanley was an African-American man who held slaves in the state of North Carolina in the 19th century. In the year 1812, he was born into slavery in the state of North Carolina but he eventually bought his freedom and that of his family. After winning his freedom, Stanley went on to establish himself as a prosperous entrepreneur and slave owner in North Carolina, where he had a plantation as well as various other companies. It is essential to keep in mind that despite the fact that Stanley held slaves, he did not enjoy the same legal protections as white slave owners and was forced to live in a segregated environment because of his race. Marie Celeste Dragon, 1777 to 1856, was a wealthy slave owner from Haiti. She was Andrea Dimitri's wife. They were a mixed race couple. She was one of the most powerful women in the history of Creole New Orleans. Dragon was a black woman who pretended to be white. She has Greek, French, and African ancestors. She was a slave owner who owned up to 40 slaves, all whom were darker in skin color because he belonged to a lighter complexion group that did not mingle with darker blacks and looked down on them in all aspects of life. Her two Creole children went to Georgetown. Alexander Dimitri, her son, was the first person of color to attend Georgetown University and the first person of color to be appointed as a United States ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like this topic about the history of slavery in the United States, please leave your comments as a way to help the growth of this channel.